All right. So we're going to continue on in our little series that we're doing um, on Sunday nights. So what I've been doing is a couple sermons now um, refuting some beliefs that are tied in with Calvinism. And uh, for those of you who might not know, you know, these, these terms and stuff, I don't know how far I want to get in depth on this. John Calvin is, was a Prot part of the Protestant Reformation. He had a lot of beliefs that basically it came out of the Catholic Church and things they thought the Catholic Church was wrong on. And he has this whole doctrine. And it's almost taken on a life of its own. I mean, from what he taught, a lot of what he taught is still applied today, but it's kind of gone even further. People have gone more uh, to its logical end with what Calvinism teaches. But there's a, to understand the, the doctrine that they believe, they have an acronym, and, and the, the word is, is TULIP. So there's, there's five points that they believe in in their Calvinist doctrine. One is the total depravity of man, that, that mankind is just completely, totally depraved, meaning that you are really base and wicked and vile and just no good whatsoever in you. You are completely repugnant to God in that... You cannot get saved even. You don't even have it within you to make a choice and to put your faith on Jesus Christ except for the fact that He has given you grace by choosing you to give you that ability to believe that you never could have even done on your own as a human being. And this is what we're going to be attacking tonight is that is this false part of the doctrine of that total depravity. The U stands for um, unconditional election, which... There is a condition. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, by the way. And we kind of dealt with this a little bit last week. Um, unconditional election, the, the L, limited atonement, meaning that the atonement that Jesus Christ paid for our sins was limited to only the people who God chose to be saved, which... We'll get into that another day, but that falls flat on its face. There's so many scriptures that say Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. Right. You know, he's the savior of the whole world, especially those that believe. So it's like, you know, that's the L. Um, the I is irresistible grace, <laughs> meaning that <laughs> when God is calling you, right, to get saved, that you basically can't do anything about it. It's irresistible. You cannot resist. If God just calls you to get saved, it's like he's throwing out the line and he hooks you and then he just pulls you in and you, there's nothing you can do about it at all. It's irresistible. Okay. And you notice throughout all of these, there's a lack of a thing called free will. And that is what Calvinism boils down to. I mean, when you just summarize it in like one word, it's just or in a couple words, it's, it's, it's the fact that they don't believe that we have free will and that God is sovereign and he picks and chooses and everything that happens in the entire world, everything you do, whatever you had to eat this morning for breakfast is because God wanted you to have that breakfast for, lunch, for, for breakfast this morning. That's what he wanted you to eat. He wanted you to eat that sausage. He wanted you to eat that cereal and he made you do that. And then, uh, and then the P is the uh, uh, perseverance of the saints. So we believe in preservation of the saints, and we're going to get into that on another one of these series too. Uh, they believe in perseverance. Basically is that if you're saved, if you're truly one of the elect, that you will persevere unto the end, meaning that you won't fall out of church, you're going to keep being a Christian, you're going to keep on doing everything all the way unto the end, or else you were never saved to begin with. And that's what they believe. So, so th that's just a summary of, of what they're doing. We're going to be going into this idea or this concept of man being totally depraved. Man just... just because I've heard him say this, that you don't even have, an unbeliever doesn't even have it in them to put their faith in Jesus Christ, as if that's some difficult thing to do, like that we're so far gone as a species, as a race, as a human being, that you are incapable of doing anything good, including even putting your faith on Jesus Christ. And as they always do, and we saw this last week, we're going to see it again this week, Everything that they believe is just pulled out of context. When you can just read everything within the context, it makes perfect sense and it's clear. They, make, they, they take a couple verses and then run with them and, and add a lot of their own logic to it and their own reasoning and, and really build it up way more than what the context is actually even saying. Last week we saw that when, they're, when it was talking about like, uh, God choosing people. And uh, before Jacob and Esau were even born, 
You know, and, and the whole context of that chapter in Romans 9 is talking about nations. It's talking about God picking and choosing which nation and, and, and which group of people that Christ was going to be born out of and things like that. Never once talk about an individual salvation, yet that's how they apply it. They just apply it to, well, see, look, God picks and chooses who gets saved. It's like, no, that's not what it's saying at all. So here we started in Romans 3. Um, very, very famous portion of Scripture, part of the Romans road. We're going to reread part of this. We're going to start in verse number 9. And what we're going to be focusing in on is the part where it says that there's, um, there's none that seeketh after God. And this is where they get part of their doctrine of man being totally depraved to where you cannot believe on, on God just out of your own will. Right? So uh, Romans 3, look at verse number 9. What then? Are we better than they? And this is referring to Jews versus Gentiles, right? Uh, and he's just explaining here in the context that, hey, we're all under sin. See, so what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, and again, this is quotation, which we're going to look up from the Old Testament, well, just like we did in Romans chapter 9, there are many places in Romans 9 that, that referenced Old Testament scripture. You have to look these things up. Right. So, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And it goes on and on and on. This is a portion of Scripture. I wanted to read it, first of all, in context. And also, I want to point out some things, too. When the Old Testament is, is quoted in the New Testament, oftentimes, they'll quote beyond the point that they're actually making and referencing that verse. Acts chapter 2 is a great example of that, where he's talking about the day of Pentecost and that... Um, on the, on the, the your, your um, young men and your maidens, you know, the, there's going to be poured out um, the spirit, and they're going to be prophesying and dreaming dreams. And it goes on, and he quotes even more stuff that's like applicable towards end times, and things that weren't necessarily happening right at that time. But he quoted the portion of scripture that contained the one part that he wanted to to focus in on and really talk about. And I believe that's what we get the same exact thing happening here in Romans chapter 3. The whole point is to say that there's no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles, which is really funny because, <laughs> you know, the, the, the elect, and we'll get in, that's a whole other sermon in and of itself also, is, you know, people who think that the Jews are God's chosen people and that God picked and chose them. And this could fall into the Calvinist doctrine also of, of you know, God picking and choosing these people and, and he's some kind of respecter of persons based on their physical heritage, which he's not. And Romans 3 is explaining that. Look, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. He says, we're all under sin. Look, whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, everybody sinned. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. And that's where it starts in verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, which that's the main point he was making anyways. No one's righteous. You know, we're all sinners. We've all fall, come short of the glory of God. Then it says, there's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. Now, I want to go and look up here. Look, go, flip if you would. You can keep your finger if you'd like. I don't know if we're necessarily going to come back to Romans 3, but I might quote a little bit more as we get into this. I, I will be referencing it. If you want to, you keep your finger there. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 14. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 are basically parallel psalms. They're almost the same exact thing. And this is where this is getting quoted from. Psalm 14, verse number 1. The Bible reads, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And this is important. I mean, just keep that in mind. 
This is the very first for, uh, uh, verse in Psalm 14 and in Psalm 53. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. Now, I believe this is talking about a specific group of people. Not every single person who is an unbeliever, just of all time, everywhere, is going to fit into this category that is being referenced here and continues to be quoted throughout Romans chapter 3. The Bible says that, you know, in Romans 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. Amen and amen. And all of this amen and amen, by the way, is all scripture. But when it says that there's none that understand, there's none that seeketh after God, they're all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. We see that's from Romans 14. But what was the context of Romans 14? The very first verse was, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. He's starting off with a fool that's, that doesn't even believe in God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was an unbeliever, I didn't say there is no God. I did not fall into the category of someone that was an atheist to just say that God's not real. There is no God. There are different levels, there are different people that, that do different things as unbelievers. There are some people that are deceived into thinking they are serving the true God. But like, like the Apostle Paul, who did it ignorantly in unbelief, he didn't, he didn't believe the gospel, but he didn't really know the gospel. He was doing what he thought was right in service to God, but it was, he was ignorant about it. Now, it doesn't make it any less of a sin. He was still a sinner. But it doesn't necessarily put him in a category. Again, he wasn't someone who said there was no God. He was trying to serve God. Right. But in Romans 14 and Psalm, or I mean, excuse me, in Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, this is talking about the fool that says, God, there is no God. Corrupt are they. They are corrupt. What? The fools that said there's no God. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Of these fools, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and see God. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now we know, because the Bible references in another place, that it is impossible to please God without faith. So before you're a believer, it, yeah, it's impossible to please God. But you need to have faith to do that. But that's not the same thing as saying it's impossible for an unbeliever to, ha to, to have faith out of their own will to, to decide to believe on Jesus. And that's where the crux of, of where the, the um, Calvinism, the fault comes in. But I want to point something else out here. Flip back, if you would, to Romans chapter 3. I wanted to point that out here. Excuse, Romans 3. I keep on saying Romans 14. Psalm 14 starts off with the fool saying there is no God. But in Romans chapter 3, it continues on. After it says there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprobable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Look at verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, again, I don't know about you, and I'm not trying to make myself sound more righteous as an unbeliever. Look, I was a hell-bound sinner before I got saved. I still am a sinner, but... I, my feet were not swift to shed blood prior to my salvation. Destruction and misery weren't in my ways as far as like, like inflicting that on other people. I had some level of a fear of God. There are things that I would not do because I had a fear of God. When we read in the book of Proverbs, and we're going to see also uh, again tonight, there are people that the Bible talks about that are the wicked doers, the, the wicked of the land, that they don't rest day or night unless they've done mischief. There are people who are evil, wicked people 
Well, I believe uh, the, when the Bible's talking about them, they're talking about reprobates. People have been rejected by God, that hate God, that have nothing to do with God, that are always just defi de devising evil, and their feet are swift to shed blood and doing all this stuff. These people are not seeking after God. But one thing I know about myself, and again, I'm going to be focusing in on this phrase of, you know, there's none that seeketh after God. Well, who is he talking about? There's none that seeketh after God. In the context of what I was referring to, I believe he's talking about the fool that said there is no God. And um, many times in the Bible, there are, there's a lot of places that talk about people that are seeking God, Right? And I, and I had a discussion with someone about, you know, about this Calvinistic thought saying that, well, it's, it's impossible for an unbeliever to put their faith in Christ because there's none that seeketh after God. So if you're not seeking after God, how are you going to put your faith in him? Right. So they take this one verse and just kind of yank it out of context and just say, see, and just apply it real broadly as opposed to what it's literally talking about. And I know myself and I know my own personal salvation. And I know that before I was saved, I was seeking God. I was not some God-hating reprobate that didn't want to have anything to do with God. Again, I'm not lifting myself up or trying to minimize how much of a sinner I was because I was a great sinner. I deserve hell. But I did want to know the truth. I did seek after God. I, I wanted to know, hey, what's real? I, and I, and this, is, this is a thought process just to let you in, if you haven't heard this before, of my own personal testimony. I was born and raised in, in a Christian home. Okay, in a, going to a Presbyterian church. We went to church regularly. We went to church faithfully. I went to the Sunday school programs. I went through the confirmation classes for two years. I learned everything about the religion. I did what I was supposed to do. But I never accepted that as my faith. It's just something that I did. And I learned, and I, and I was a relatively good kid. I wasn't really rebellious or, or disobedient or anything like that. So when it was time to go to church, I went to church. Was I bored? You bet I was bored. But it was what it was. I mean, it was just what I did because I was a kid. You know, that's okay, fine. When I became an adult, when I got, you know, moved out of the house, went to college, whatever, I did my own thing. But there came a point to where, I mean, it was bugging me. I wanted to know what the truth was. And I didn't want to have, just because I was raised in a Christian home, I, I, was, I was using my mind enough to recognize just because I'm raised a certain way doesn't mean that that's right. What about all these people who are, grow up in Saudi Arabia and or wherever, or in Turkey or anywhere across the world, and they have, you know, Islam as their religion? And that's what they're taught and raised from the moment they're, is that just mean that they're going to be, you know, involved in that religion just because that's how they're raised? I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to know what the truth was. So in my own, you know, way of trying to find the truth, I decided, well, I'm going to look into all the religions. I'm going to look at everything. And I even went to some debate where there was like a, a Muslim guy and a Christian guy and they were debating and stuff. And I said, well, I wanted to see. I wanted to hear. What do you got to say? What are your points? Convince me, right? Persuade me. I wanted, I was on a quest to find what the truth was. So to say that every unbeliever never seeks after God, based on this one verse, I think is faulty because I know that I was seeking after God. Now, I didn't know how to do it. I was still a sinner. I wasn't pleasing in God's eyes because I didn't have faith in him. But I wanted to know what was true and what was not true. What ends up happening with this Calvinist doctrine is that they take these verses, apply it to everyone, and basically what ends up happening is the, the reprobate doctrine gets tossed on its head because what, what they'll end up saying then is every unbeliever is a reprobate. Everybody is rejected of God. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. You're in Romans 3. Just flip back to Romans chapter 1. And I want to point this out to you. because, And look, we've gone over this plenty of times in this church. If you've been coming here for any length of time, you, you, you probably have heard this explained to you, what we believe about people who have become rejected by God. Romans chapter 1 explains how that happens. It explains how a person hears the truth of God. They reject the truth of God. They make up their own God and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And then God ends up rejecting them. Romans chapter 1 explains that. Proverbs chapter 1 explains that as, as well as other places in the Bible where, where people become rejected. But what the Calvinist does is they'll take that and then just see, well, this, is, this applies to everybody. But no, it doesn't. Not everybody is a depraved reprobate 
that, you know, and, and think about this. This makes sense. How many people are out there just in this world would you consider just to be totally depraved? I mean, when I think of depraved, I think of Jeffrey Dahmer. Someone who has zero conscience, someone who can do whatever, a total psychopath, sociopath that just nothing phases them. They're depraved. They could eat human flesh. They can defile children. They can do these wicked, horrible, torturous things to people. Doesn't bother them. That's a depraved person. I'll tell you what, there's a big difference between that person and average unsaved Joe down the street who's never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and is just living his life. Right. Not the same thing at all. But let's look here at Romans 1, because I, I, I just want to get this real quick. What the Bible is talking about a reprobate and how this can't apply to everybody. Because there are symptoms of someone who's become a reprobate that not everybody has. But every reprobate has. Look at, um, let's start in verse number 19. Because that, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Excuse me. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And this is where we start to see, and, and as we get in this, it'll be more clear. This is where the path to reprobation starts. They knew God. Not everyone even knows God. In order to know God, you've heard about him, you've heard the truth preached unto you about God. You know God. But they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but they came vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They made up their own gods. They made their own idols and just said, well, no, this is God. I heard that about God, but no, I don't like that God. I like this, this statue. I like the, you know, this animal, this cow, whatever. Verse 24, wherefore, which means because of this, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So again, it kind of reiterates, these people have done this. They've, they've worshipped and served a creature more than a creator. They knew who God was. They didn't want anything to do with God, so they made up their own gods. And as a result, God says, Fine. You know about me, you don't want to accept me, you just want to reject me, you want to make up your own gods, then I'm going to give you up. Verse 26, for this cause. What cause? The cause of worshiping and serving a creature more than the creator. When they know who the creator is. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that, that recompense of their error which was mean. And this is your sodomites, this is your, your homosexuals, and this is the evidence that is put forth that they are reprobate because they start doing these things. Because before that, it's not natural. It's not something you would naturally do. A man with a man or a woman with a woman, you don't naturally do these things until God just given you over to this reprobate mind to do it. Verse 28 speaks volumes. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And this is why Romans 1 does not apply to everybody because in order to not like to retain God in your knowledge, you have to have had God in your knowledge. Not everybody has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everyone has heard and known about the true and living God. So in order for this to apply to everyone, everyone would have had to know known about him. But look at verse 29 and then it goes through this whole list. Being filled with all unrighteousness. All unrighteous. I mean, everything unrighteous. Is, these people are filled with that fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You go through this whole list. There's a lot of things in it. I, I read through it really quickly, but look at them individually closely. These are some pretty serious sins. 
if someone has all of these attributes, that is a totally depraved person. And I'll agree with that. It is a depraved person. I mean, that's a, that is a wicked person that, to, to have all these attributes. I'm sorry. This is not average unsaved person. They have not gotten to this state. But I believe that this is who, what Romans 3 is alluding to when it's talking about, you know, the fool said in his heart, there is no God, and there's none that seeketh after God. No, not one. And, and there are people that seek after God. So I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Turn, if you would, to um, Acts chapter 17. I'm going to read you from Psalm 9. Now, there are many, 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 many references in the Bible of people that are seeking after God. But the question is, and this is, you know, if we're, if we're refuting Calvinism, the question is going to be, is it, talking about, is it ever talking about people who are unsaved, though, people who are unbelievers? Because it could be easily proven that many of those instances is talking about people who already believe on the Lord. People are already children of God, and they're seeking after God, and they're, you know, they're, they're going back to God. Maybe they backslid, and now they're going back to God, and they're seeking after God. So I didn't want to use any of those verses because it's, it's not proving the point, right? The point is that I believe there are some people that could be an unbeliever and still try to seek after God. In Psalm 9, verse number 10, the Bible reads, and they, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. So, it says here, they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. So, a lot of people putting their trust in, the, in, in God, and it's kind of like at that moment of salvation that uh, thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee, kind of saying that they sought God and then they believed and got saved. But Acts chapter 17 gives a little bit of a better example, I think. And this is the Apostle Paul was speaking um, on Mars Hill. He's given his, his, uh, his little sermon there. Look at verse number 24. And he's explaining to them, you know how they had all their idols in the land. And uh, they had one, one to the unknown God. And he says, you know what? That unknown God, because they have all these other gods and all these other statutes and memorials. And he says, I'm going to tell you about the unknown God because you guys don't know who God is and you have this one statue of the unknown God. I'm going to declare him unto you because that's the real God. It's the one that you don't know. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. If haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And he's saying here that God has, has determined the times before appointed. God has determined the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. God has determined that, that people should seek the Lord if happy they might feel after him and find him. You know, and why do you have to feel after him? Because when you're an unbeliever, you're blind. And all you can do is try to stumble around and feel out and, and just, where, you know, where is God? Even though he's not far, right? He's not far at all from any one of us. Right. And we also have a good example in Acts also with Cornelius. And that's in, I think it's in Acts chapter 10. I think I might have that in my notes somewhere. But, um... Cornelius was a man, and I brought him up, I think it was last week. He was unsaved. And God sent Peter to give him the gospel. And we know that he was unsaved. So he was a man that was religious, though. He gave money for, like, temples to be built, and, and he prayed, and he was doing all this stuff, right? And he was, thought he was doing righteously, and he prayed to God, and God basically answered his prayer by sending Peter to go and preach the gospel to him. So we have a, 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 you know, a real-life example in the book of Acts of someone who was not saved but was seeking God. And thought he was doing right, and God sent somebody and said, oh, okay, here, here's someone that's going to be receptive and hear the gospel. Just like, you know, we have all had ministers by whom we believed, I don't think it was an accident that, that when I got saved, I just so happened to be at a point in my life 
very shortly after I was trying to seek out God and try to figure out what the truth was. Now, God had tried to reach me prior to that. I remember someone coming and knocking on my door earlier on before all that happened and me just shutting the door. Didn't want to have anything to do with it then. But thankfully, I didn't get too far gone to, to where God had given me enough chances and just said, well, fine, forget it. You made your choice. And, and I was able to uh, be found of God and that, and that he was able to, uh, you know, and he sent someone for me to hear the gospel. But um, this idea that everyone is reprobate until God gives them the ability to believe through grace no. is just nonsense. It's just nonsense. Um, yeah, turn if you would to Isaiah 55. I want to show you this one more passage. I've got a lot of notes, and I don't think I'm going to get to all of them. I spent, I spent quite a bit of time preparing this with the Scripture because there's a lot on this topic. Isaiah 55, verse number 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight in itself in, fa in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee, shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And I say here, you know, another commandment saying, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Amen. And I think this applies to unbelievers. Call upon him while he is near. Right. You know, don't wait too long before you get saved. Seek him while he can still be found. Seek him before it's too late, before the day of salvation passes you. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Right? It's the appointed time. Now is the day. And, and seek God while he still may be found. Look at verse number 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in a singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 10. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to skip some of this. I have too many pages of notes. Go, if you would, to Proverbs 1. I'm going to read Psalm 10 for you. Just We're going to get through this. I really wanted to set the distinction between the wicked person who would be, we consider to be like a reprobate, someone who is truly this depraved person, versus everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because there is a difference. In the, the Bible talks about definitely a distinction of certain people. But it's, it's not, it cannot be applied to just everybody ever who's been, who's been unsaved. 
Psalm 10, I'll read this for you. Verse 1, Why standest thou afar off, Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. So we're starting off with the wicked. Now, again, I wasn't someone, and again, me personally, wasn't someone who was persecuting the poor, right? I was unsaved. I was a sinner. Yeah, but I mean, I wasn't like just had it out for people and trying to use and abuse poor people. It just, it just wasn't what I was doing. Verse 3, For the wicked boasteth, boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So again, we see, yeah, the wicked is not going to seek after God. And I believe this is who we're talking about in Romans chapter 3, that they're all gone out of the way. There's none that seek after God. Verse number 5, His ways are always grievous thy judgments are far above out of his sight as for all his enemies he puffeth at them he hath said in his heart i shall not be moved for i shall never be in adversity his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud under his tongue is mischief and vanity again talking about the wicked person he sitteth in the lurking places of the villages in the secret places doth he murder the innocent his eyes are privily set against the poor he lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord God. Lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? Contemn means hate. They hate God. He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. This is someone who has no regard whatsoever for the Lord, for God, or for anyone else for that matter. They prey upon the poor. They wicked, they're wicked. They devise. They murder people. That is a specific type of person. The Bible calls them the wicked. We've seen that in Proverbs. We see it here in Psalm 10. These are the people that are the ones that are not seeking after God. They're saying, God doesn't see what's going on, and they mock Him, and they're lifted up in their pride. Your average unbeliever is not, does not have this attitude. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1 actually even tells us that these people have already been rejected by God. Some of them will seek after God. So again, the Calvinist tries to tell you that it's impossible for anyone who's an unbeliever to even seek after God, right? That's what they'll say according to their doctrine. Look at Proverbs 1, verse 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Remember, seek God while he may be found. Well, for the reprobate, it's too late. He can't be found after you've already been rejected and God's hardened your heart. And here, it, I mean, these are clear. Like, and you read it in context. Go home and read all Proverbs 1. This is not talking about a believer. This is an unbeliever. This is someone who, who, who knew God and glorified him not as God and became vain in their own imagination, just like Romans 1 says. And it's saying right here that they shall seek me early. So right there, I mean, that refutes the, this, this, this nonsense of nobody, it's impossible for any unbeliever to ever seek after God. I mean, here they're not going to find him, but they're going to seek him. Verse 29, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. See, God gave them chances. God, God wanted them to hear. God wanted them to learn. God wanted them to get saved. But they despised it. They hated it. They didn't want anything to do with it. So likewise, God says, okay, well, I'm going to laugh when your fear cometh. I'm going to mock. When your fear cometh as the whirlwind, he says, I'm going to laugh at you. Uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm 145. There's a couple of verses I want to look at here. And I mentioned this last week, but one of the big terms that the Calvinists like to throw around is, is the sovereignty of God, meaning that God's in charge of everything. And, and you know, when they say that word, it might be different. You say, well, yeah, God's sovereign, right? 
because he's a king and he's in charge, you know, he's in charge, he's in control. I mean, it makes sense to someone who just uses that, thinks about that word normally as you would normally apply it. But the way that they Im imply the meaning is that he literally is the puppet master of everything that happens. And that everything that happens is because he wanted it to happen. And that's actually perverted because you think about all the wicked things that happen and the people who do get defiled and, you know, it's like, God didn't cause those things to happen. The Bible says those things didn't even enter into his mind. Right. When, when, the, children, you know, when, when the, the heathen were like, you know, offering up their children as sacrifices and burning them in the fire, he's like, those things never even entered into my mind. Right. And they did it. Yeah, God's not causing those things to happen. No way. No way. That's a, that, is a, that is a twisted God if you think that God's doing all that stuff. In Psalm 145, verse 18, I, I would ask you this because they say, you know, God's sovereignty. Where is God's sovereignty, in, it's God's sovereignty in these verses? Verse number 18, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. So does this sound at all like God is making these people call upon him? He says he's there and he's ready to hear them, but he's not making them. These are conditions that a man must meet. You know, he's, 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 the Lord is nigh. It means he's close unto all that call upon him. He's right there, but he's waiting for someone to actually call upon him. It's all that call upon him in truth, right? He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. But he's waiting for them to call on him. Why even play the charade and go through this nonsense if he's just going to make them call on him anyway? You know, the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. But um, go, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. I don't know why it's so hard to just believe what the Scripture says. Just to look at it and say, here's what it says, I believe it. The Calvinists overanalyze Scripture to the point where they start adding things that are not there because of basically a flawed understanding of just one verse. Right. I mean, that's what they do. Is they'll take one verse out, they, don't, they kind of misinterpret it, and then just build, yeah, they run with it, they build this entire doctrine based off of that one misconception. Here's an example, of the, you know, because I've gotten in these discussions before of an over-analysis. You could say, well, God knows the beginning from the end, right? God formed and fashioned me in the womb, right? So he made me the way that I am. And, what, and here's, here's the train of thought they go down. Well, God already knew what things were going to happen in my life. God made me the way that I am, so he knew how I would react to each of these situations. So God knew all the things I would do. And if he knew this in advance, then he must have made me this way to do all of these things that I did Therefore, alleviating basically your own responsibility of that, well, God knew all this stuff and he made me this way anyways and he knew that I would respond this way and he knew that I would respond that way. So it must just be all according to God's will that I did these things. No. That's a, there's a there's flaw in your, your, your logic, your analysis of the situation. And see, when you start getting into these, these rabbit trails and these, these, these ways of thinking, You've just completely gotten rid of all Scripture. Right. And, and what you're doing is just, just in your own mind trying to grasp a concept without a foundation. Right. I mean, we, it, it, what we believe is should be coming from the Word of God first and foremost that we try to understand these things as the best we can, but I'm not going to come up with an entire doctrine just based on whatever comes out of my heart or my limited ability to even understand you know, eternal concepts, for example. I mean, some of these things are, are really deep and they're, they're, they are difficult for us to understand. But, um, but some things aren't. I mean, it, <laughs> let's go Romans 10. Look at verse number 8. I think we covered this last week. I'm going to go through it real, real briefly this week. Romans 10, 8. But what saith that the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Okay? The man believes. 
They choose. They decide what they're going to believe. It's what the, it's what the Bible says. It doesn't say God, you know, for with the heart, God gives man the, the, or tells man to believe or, so, you know, whatever. Whatever it is that they're, that they're trying to say, it's not there. For the scripture saith, verse 11, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? It is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This is the entire breakdown of how people get saved. You need to hear, you need to believe, and someone needs to preach it to you, and they need to be sent in order to preach that gospel. I mean, that's just, that's the way it works. That's the way people get saved. I don't see anywhere in this breakdown of how people get saved any mention of only those God called, where it's not everybody. There's no mention of that. The decision not really belonging to someone that is lost. It's not in there. The rest of the chapter still explains that even people that aren't seeking after God are still going to hear the gospel. So let's say you say, Pastor Burzins, I don't agree with what you said about, you know, I still think that nobody ever seeks after God and that you're wrong and that you weren't really seeking after God when you were an unbeliever. Well, whatever, okay? You're still going to hear the God. The Bible says, look at verse number 16 there in Romans 10. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. So one of the jobs of preaching the gospels is to go out and preach it to everybody whether or not they're seeking God or not. I mean, there are people who, whose doors we knock that, that aren't seeking God. Right. But they have a conversation with them. We get to show them the gospel and they end up getting saved. They decide, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ. And they're not, they weren't seeking God at the time, but they still heard the gospel and had that opportunity to believe. And that's the whole point of, of doing the soul winning anyway. We're supposed to go out and just preach the gospel to everybody so that everybody could have the best opportunity that they have. Uh, verse 21, But the Israelis saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. See, God is still trying. Whether you're seeking him or not, God's still trying. But the choice is yours. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. There, there's, <laughs> there's so much scripture to, to go over with this. I believe this is a Calvinist doctrine, but it goes beyond just people who would call themselves Calvinist, where... Um, They've been influenced by the Calvinist thought where they'll say that only those who God draws can get saved. If God's tugging on you, you know, maybe God's not tugging at you, but when he's drawing you, and it's part of that irresistible grace thing, and it's part of that, it also goes hand in hand with their total depravity of like, well, you need, you know, God needs to be drawing you or else you can't be saved. And what they do is they use John chapter 6 to support their doctrine. At least here, there's a scripture. I mean, with everything else we've been talking about, there's like no, almost no scripture for this. But look at uh, verse number 43 of John chapter 6. And again, if this is the only verse we ever looked at and decided to make a doctrine run with it, I could see where you're coming from. But when you're not using the entire Bible in context. John 6, 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. Oh, okay, well, that makes sense, right? No one can come to Jesus unless God has drawn them. Sure. It says what it says, right? I mean, I'm not going to twist these words. That's what he said. That's what he meant. You can't come unto Jesus unless God draws you. Well, uh, verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, all, 
Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, turn, if you would, to John chapter 12. You say, well, no man can come unto me except the Father hath drawn him. Are there people then that God is not drawn, that God doesn't want to be saved, that he's not calling? Let's look at John chapter 12, verse number 30. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So when he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, the next verse says he, he said that because it was, it, he was explaining what death he would die, the death of the cross. He was lifted up from the earth when he was nailed to that cross and they lifted him up, literally hanging up above the earth on the tree, right? And, he, and was, and let me ask you this, because th he was alive when he said this before he went to the cross. Was Jesus lifted up and hung on a cross? Yes. He says, if that happens, if I'm lifted up, then I will draw all men unto me. He draw, it happened, so he must have drawn all men unto him. So if you're going to use John chapter 6, use John chapter 12 also to see that no one could come unto me except the Father which has sent me, draw him. Well, Jesus said, if I'm lifted up from earth, then I'm going to draw all men unto me. He's drawing everybody. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. It, just, it all lines up. There's no contradiction here. We don't have to go through any mental acrobatics to try to make these things fit together. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I mentioned this earlier. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul received mercy because he sinned ignorantly, because he did it in unbelief. How could this even make sense? if a man is not capable of making a decision on his own. The fact that he could obtain mercy by doing something ignorantly, if he was incapable of making the decision, it, it, does, it doesn't make any sense. How can God hold a man responsible for what he does if he's incapable of choosing right? Basically. That's not a just judge. You are completely incapable of doing anything right ever. You are completely incapable of following any of my commands ever. But I'm still going to hold you guilty when you, when you don't do it. No. We, he's given us the ability to, to obey. There are some times when we do obey and some times when we don't. We have the ability to do it. Now, no one is perfect. No one has been able to do that other than Christ, but... We ultimately, the responsibility falls on us. We have failed. But it's not because God made us fail. It's because of our own lust. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse number 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So he's saying this is why the law was made, for all these various sins, all these things that people can do. Excuse me, there's a law for that. Verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Ignorant means he didn't know. He didn't know any better. In his unbelief, he didn't know that what he was doing wasn't right. He didn't know that he wasn't serving God. He thought he was. He, he was zealous for his religion, which was a false religion, but he thought he was doing what was right. And because of that, even though he was attacking the church, getting people arrested that were believers, and, and really being a, a doing very wickedly against the church, he obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly. Look at verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant 
with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He didn't say that he obtained mercy because God gave him the ability to believe. He put his faith. He believed. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, you have to turn there. Turn if you would to Psalm 116. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. I believe. That's an action taken by the individual. Again, with no reference to God empowering them to believe and that being necessary in order to believe. It's just something that they make up. Psalm 116, I just want you to take note. We're almost done. I'm, I'm trying to fly through a lot of this stuff. There's a lot more that could be said on all of these passages. But uh, Psalm 116, pay attention to all the times that David says, I did this and I did that. And, and he's the one doing it. The source isn't anybody else. He's doing these things. Psalm 116, verse 1, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow, then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple." I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will. Whose wills? His will. I will call upon, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. He has the will to do that. It is his will that, that calls on the name of the Lord. I mean, I was talking to a guy today for a long time, giving him the gospel before he finally did call on God. And he had been to four different types of churches. And, he, you know, it's kind of saying, oh, everyone has all these various beliefs and all these other things. And the conversation went, well, but you have to decide what you believe. Yeah, of course there's a lot of people out there who say different things. You know, whatever. People believe, it doesn't make them all right, though. They can't all be right. We can all be wrong or someone's going to be right. But, you know, just because they believe something different doesn't mean anything about the truth. Right doesn't change the truth. It doesn't change what's written. I said, you know, people can try to say different things about the Bible, but the Bible still says what it says. Right. The words are still here. They still say the same thing. And I was trying to explain to him that, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, I said any time that I see somebody trying to tell me that, well, this is what the Bible says, but what it really means is this. I said, watch out for that guy because they're a false prophet. They're trying to lie to me. They're trying to pull one over on me. God's not the type of God that's just going to say, well, here's what it says, but, you know, that's not really what it means. It really means just something completely different. Watch out for those people. I, I believe the guy, like, you know, we're talking, about, we're talking about all kinds of different things. I'm just showing them. I'm like, look, I'm not going to try to tell you this means something else. This is talking about hell. This is talking about people being tortured with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. I believe what that says. I'm not going to tell you it means something different just to try to tell you that hell doesn't exist because I don't want it to exist. It's right there in black and white. This book still says the same thing. Just because other people want to twist it and pervert it and say whatever they want about it doesn't make this any less true. But you have to decide what you believe. Right. Everyone else decides what they believe. You decide what you believe. We have that ability. We are not so far gone and depraved as a, as a person, as a human being, that you just can't even make up a decision. You can't even make up your mind. You can't even form a decision that would be a right decision. It's like these Calvinists think, well, you could, you know, God's giving you the ability to make your decision on all these other things, but they're all just wrong. The only thing that you can't make a decision on is that which is right. OK, 
okay? Why? It doesn't make any sense. The choice is up to every individual. Turn if you to Romans 7. It's the last place I'll be turned. I'm going to read for you from De Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. It's your choice. I, here's the options. You've got life and death. You have blessing and cursing. You could do what's right. You could do what's wicked. Make your choice. Oh, but by the way, you don't really have a choice because I'm a God of, of, of Calvin. That doesn't really give you the choice, even though I'm telling you to choose. The author of confusion. Who's that again? Oh, wait, that's not the Lord. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. You're in Romans chapter 7. Look at verse number 7. I just want to, this one last point. We all start out alive. This nonsense of God picking and choosing people and that us being totally depraved. See, the problem with, with, with us being totally depraved is that you would have to start off that way from an infant, right. from, from, from being created in the womb. Right. You'd have to just be totally depraved. According to Calvin, I mean, that's... In, in what sense does that make? And then, how, if that's the case, how do you reconcile Romans 7? Look at verse number 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Again, giving, you know, giving the understanding that without the law there is no sin. I mean, there, there has to be something that says you can't do this before you could be in transgression or breaking that law. I mean, it has to exist. That's, and that's what sin is. Sin is the transgression of the law. So that's what he's explaining here. But look at verse number 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. When there is no law, there is no sin. Sin's dead. It doesn't exist because there's no law. But look at verse 9. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. It killed him. So wait, he was alive without the law once. Right. Apostle Paul's not that old. He wasn't older than Moses. So... When he was alive without the law once, he's not referring to before God had given the law into the hands of Moses. Right. He's talking about a point earlier in his life. We're all alive once. The problem is, is that when we sin, the day that thou sinnest, thou shalt surely die. It's the same thing that happens to us as what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. When God created Adam and Eve, they were alive. And God said, hey, when you, you break my commandment, you're going you're gonna to die in that day. And they surely did die. They didn't die physically, but their spirit died when they broke God's law. When we're born, we have no knowledge of the law. We don't know what's right and wrong. We're still developing. We're still growing. There is no law on an infant. You can't know any better. You have, you have no knowledge of it. Where there's no law, there's no sin. It's not until you, 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 know, you can understand right from wrong and make the choice and sin, and then that sin that's deceived you into doing what's wrong kills you. And that's when you die, and that's why you need to be reborn. That's why you need that second birth. Amen. That's the whole point. The, 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 the God of Calvinism, though, they're all depraved. 
I mean, really, if you, and, and I don't think they'll say this, but because they'll still want to hold on to their elect doctrine and say, well, some babies go to heaven, some babies go to hell, just based on whatever God chose. But if we're totally depraved, they'd all have to go to hell because they didn't believe. Oh, well, they would have believed. No, not if we're totally depraved. I mean, they couldn't even do anything about it. They're all, they're all just falling under that original sin of Adam, according to the Calvinists. Again, I, I did a whole sermon just on original sin and how that's a fallacy, too. We have a sin nature, but it's not something that God holds us responsible for, for Adam sinning in the garden. The sin that Adam did isn't, we're not paying for that. Like, God doesn't hold us accountable for what he did, that we just have this debt of sin that's, that we owe because of something someone else did. That's ridiculous. God doesn't hold us responsible in that sense, so... Um, you know, infants don't sin. The total depravity is, doesn't make any sense. The rest of this chapter, you know, in Romans 7, actually explains that it's our flesh that drives us to sin, but the spirit that drives us to do good. And, you know, the Calvinist loves to go and use the rest of Romans 7, which we're, we're already over time, and I'm not going to get into that. Read it for yourself. And it talks about the battle between the flesh and the man, you know, and, and how he says, you know, oh, wicked man that I am, who shall, uh, um, you know, free me from, from this body of sin? And uh, that's, they take those verses and say, see, the only reason he's not totally depraved is because he has the spirit, but the flesh is just completely, totally depraved, which they're not getting the point he's making at all. But, um, you can't jump to that part without overlooking this first part where he said, I was alive without the law once. If he's totally depraved, you couldn't have been alive without the law once. But he was. <clears throat> so are there none that seeketh God? Again, I, I think it, it, who he's talking about and who that the scripture reference in Romans 3 was going back to, the, the, the Old Testament quote, yeah, those people weren't seeking after God. They're, you know, the, the, are we incapable of seeking after God as an unbeliever? I don't think so. I think we ought to seek. I think unbelievers should seek after God. If happily they may be found, you know, he may be found of them. I think that's the, the teaching that we get from this. Don't, don't buy into this. And I'm sorry, I hope, I hope this isn't too boring tonight. Calvin is pretty boring. I get bored by it. But the reason why I go over it is because it is important. It's, it's real pervasive. It, it, it infects Baptist churches. You know, it's real big in the Protestant churches. This is something that, you know, growing up in a Presbyterian church, that is like, the, we believe that. That's like what was taught to me. That's, that's the doctrine of these Protestant Reformed churches. And um, it has a lot of implications. The people who, who typically will adhere to Calvinist doctrine, many people are, are, are these intelligent people, right? People who you think, wow, that person's way smarter than me. And they end up deceiving a lot of people because people don't give themselves enough credit to just be able to understand God's word when you're saved and just say, well, that person just knows way more than me. So, I mean, if they're saying it, then it's probably true. That's dangerous when you start relying on people like that. I mean, don't rely on me like that. Don't rely on anyone like that. You're saved, you know, get in your own Bible and read it for yourself. Study to show yourself approved unto God. But just because someone seems really intelligent or even is, in, especially in worldly things, I mean, I know so many people that in this world are very intelligent, know a lot of things. But when it comes to the Bible, you know, they, they overanalyze things and they, and they get too academic about things that, nothing wrong with academics, but it's like, you start picking things apart and causing contradictions within the Bible as a result of their micro-analyzing things that that wasn't the point at all of, of the words that were spoken. So um, be aware of that. We're gonna, I don't know if I'm going to do this again next week. I, need, I might need to take a break from the Calvinism thing. <laughs> but we are going to end up hitting, hitting many. I have, I have already got three other sermons in mind that I want to teach that... that our good doctrine, I mean, we're, we're, we're learning some good doctrine, the right doctrine, as we combat um, these, these lies of Calvinism. But uh, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to have 
um, simplicity and understanding that we can look at the surface meanings of, of all of your words and be able to, to just understand them and believe them, dear Lord. I know that there are so many more deep, hidden meanings and, and so um, infinite deep meanings in the Bible, God, but um, help us understand those as well, but not at the expense of just learning the, the basic truths. Uh, help us to be able to build our foundation as we dig deeper into your word that it, it, it never is contradictory to the things that are on the surface, Lord, and um, pray that you please help us not to be beguiled by any of these people that seem very intelligent but are completely lacking in their understanding, Lord. Just uh, give us sound doctrine that we can serve you to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.